and gentlemen, we are very lucky today to have our guest, Juanita Headley, in studio, well, through Zoom in St. Vincent right now. So I want to give a quick thanks to Juanita for coming in today to talk to us about human trafficking awareness. And so off to you, Ms. Headley. So a quick thanks again to Ms. Headley for coming in this afternoon to give us a talk about human trafficking awareness, and she's going to give us something to acknowledge and to give us knowledge about in this very important um, topic. So thank you so much again, Ms. Juanita, for coming in today. So take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And I've got to apologize in advance. I've been having some technical difficulties. So I'm hoping that you'll all be able to hear me throughout. I'm really grateful to have had this chance to speak once again on GEM FM. So I really have to thank your father for this opportunity, particularly as this is Human Trafficking Awareness Month, which to me is the month of January is the chance for those of us in the anti-trafficking world to get together and to educate people on what is a truly important topic. For me, I don't feel comfortable using the term awareness because as I said last week, in my mind, awareness is knowing and doing nothing. And so it's quite difficult for me to talk about it being Human Trafficking Awareness Month because I believe that our duty and our obligation in the fight against trafficking is to do so much more than to raise awareness, but it's in fact to educate people and empower them on this topic to enable them to be able to safeguard themselves and the people around them. I want to discuss today some of the things that I have been reading in relation to the most recent article that is available on Facebook on the Searchlight newspaper website. This is an article that was written around the time of Human Trafficking Awareness Day, which is the 11th of January. It was written to acknowledge this very important day and to allow the opportunity for the readers to get a bit of a greater idea and understanding of what human trafficking looks like, particularly in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Unfortunately, the article was released a week later than initially anticipated. However, as the saying goes, better late than never. And I'm certainly grateful that the article was indeed in print for people to be able to get a bit more of an understanding of what this issue looks like. One of the observations that I made is that when many people read or hear about this topic, particularly in the Caribbean, but specifically in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, which is where I'm currently, people often will see or perceive the article, the information, as being this information. In other words, it is not accurate. And I know that there are people around the world who maybe have similar questions, ideas, false understandings of what human trafficking looks like. So I thought it'd be appropriate to discuss some of the things that were said and to provide information to, in other words, enlighten the audience as to why those statements or thoughts are incorrect. Now, I made note of them, so I'll be referring to some of the information that I wrote down in relation to the questions, the comments, and the feedback that were presented in the comments section of the Searchlight article that was in print last week, Thursday. Now, one of the questions that somebody asked was, why do I not go to Central America? This person seemed to think that they were a Canadian because they even went on to say that I am in St. Vincent and the Grenadines talking on this topic for the purpose of a thesis. I responded, ha ha, I'm actually a US attorney and have been licensed for almost seven years. When I came back to make note of the various questions and comments in preparation for today's interview, I saw they had added additional information from their original comments, why do I not go to South America and I have a thesis? And they went on to go to more detail to say that this is not a problem that is happening in Simmons is happening elsewhere and so therefore they were saying I am in the wrong place now what I will say because of my faith in Jesus Christ because of my lifelong ministry in other words the ministry that I have been living for the greater part of my life is actually traveling the world serving the communities educating and empowering them on this particular topic in fact, I very much live like Luke chapter 10 in the Bible, which is when 
Jesus told the disciples to go out without taking spare clothing, spare shoes, gold or silver, and when they go to various homes, when they are not received the dust of their feet. So I have been living like that for almost a decade. And therefore, when the comment was made, why not South or Central America, what the person does not understand is that I do not have a choice as to where I go. Now, for those people who do not understand my life and they think that I simply look at the map, close my eyes, and point to the destination, this is very far from the truth. I'm a born-again Christian, and it is my faith in Jesus Christ that determines what I do, how I do it, and when I do it. I'm an imperfect human being, but I'm using whatever tools and resources available to me to do what I believe is God's commission and God's command and direction for my life. I believe this is my ministry. Therefore, in answer to any question as to why am I in St. Vincent or why am I in the Philippines, why am I in Ghana, why have I selected to that country and why am I bringing my message to that nation of people, quite simply, I don't have a choice. August 14 of last year, I quit my paying job working with domestic violence and sex trafficking victims. And on the 19th of August, I flew to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Unfortunately, well, I should say unfortunately, but fortunately, my flight on September 10th was canceled. As a result of that cancellation, I'm still here, which was indeed an answer prayer. As the Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will grant your heart's desire. I am in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, not because I chose to come here, but because I felt God leading me here. And so therefore, when a person asks, there's more of an issue. I will tell them I'm exactly where God has sent me and where God wants me to be. I don't know if this person was a believer or a non-believer, but what I can say is, for me personally, wherever the Lord leads, I will follow. And what we have to appreciate is that this is an issue, this is a problem that affects every country around the world, and therefore, it is information we all need to hear. So I'll explain that again because I realize that I'm coming in and out. What I was saying is for me personally, because of the life that I live and because of the calling I have on my life, I go wherever God has led me. On August 14th, I quit my job. On August 19th, I flew to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. September 10th, my flight was canceled, which was an answer prayer and a blessing in disguise. And that is why I'm here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, even up to this point. And that is one of the reasons I gave my message. It is a message because every one of us around the world is impacted and affected by human trafficking. There is sex trafficking and labor trafficking, which are very common. We also know about organ trafficking. Organ trafficking is actually a big problem in China. But not just in China, it happens in other parts of the world as well. I focus primarily on sex trafficking because I was indeed the unfortunate victim of childhood sexual abuse from the ages of four to 10 by my mother's first husband. Because I have been a victim and I'm now a survivor of sexual abuse, I talk about a topic that is very close to home. Because when a person has been abused, they become vulnerable to exploitation, vulnerable to being abused again, vulnerable to being trafficked. And I will go into a little bit more detail when I answer some of the other questions. But for anybody who wonders, why is Ms. Headley in St. Vincent and the Grenadines? Why is she not in Trinidad, for example, or India? I am wherever God leads me. Wherever God leads, I will follow. And so that is why I'm not in Central America. Is it my desire to spend time in South or Central America? If that is where God wants me to be, absolutely. I don't want this to sound cliche, but for me, primarily, my passion is for Asia. I do not speak a word of Spanish, despite having a Spanish-sounding name. My passion is for Asia, particularly the Philippines and India. However, if God sends me to South or Central America, I will certainly go there. However, I appreciate that in certain parts of the world where trafficking is a bigger business than where it may be in, let's say, St. Vincent or Trinidad, it would put me more at risk, and therefore, the vulnerability increases, and I would most certainly need to have a team of people around me to enable me to do my work safely. God forbid I go somewhere God hasn't called me. I would not want any harm to come to me, let alone for me to lose my life. This is an important message, and I believe every one of us has a calling, and we have a duty to hold that baton, to be that light that is not under a bushel, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. One of the other questions that was asked, you are in the wrong environment. 
In other words, people are saying, why are you here? Someone else commented, just trying to find the comment. They said that Vincent's are not American. It is a US problem. So tackling both of those, me being in the wrong environment and about this not being America, although my accent changes frequently, I am a British citizen, Jamaican parents. I was born in England, but I travel the world a lot. And for almost the last decade, I have been traveling consistently. And so my accent changes. In the Bible, we know in scripture, it talks about the different gifts of the spirit. One of those gifts is speaking in tongues. I do not speak in tongues, but I speak in different accents. So I would say that is indeed a gift I have. When I am in Cambodia, if I can change my accent, people will understand me a lot better. No matter where I go, the message continues to be relevant, but of course there are cultural differences. In parts of Asia, like India, we have the issue of child marriage. That is not an Indian problem, because in Jewish communities in the United States, we also have an issue there of child marriage. Every country has different problems. Some of the problems are very similar. Some of the problems are very different. But the fact is, no country is immune from exploitation. No country is immune from crime. At the end of the day, as we all know, bad things do sometimes happen to good people, and often far too often than not. I am a U.S. attorney. I've been a licensed attorney for almost seven years unpaid. I'm a pro bono attorney. Quite simply, it is not a missionary thing or a Christian thing. I'm a pro bono attorney because I do not have a green card, a visa, or a work permit. Therefore, when I'm in the United States, I provide free legal advice to those who cannot afford a lawyer. I did not grow up in the U.S. I have never lived there. I spent four years there, six months in, and then I would cross the border and return. Six months in, and I'll go out another six months. I did that for four years, but I'm not an American. I'm an English citizen who has traveled thus far to 38 countries. I do a lot of reading. I do a lot of research. I talk to victims and survivors of abuse, of exploitation. I spend time in the red light district. My desire is always to learn. The Bible says people perish for lack of knowledge. Knowledge is power. And reading the comments on this article, it saddened me because people are making statements not on the basis of facts, but on the basis of a lack of knowledge. For example, if I read an article that says in the UK, some men, and that's an important word, some men from Lebanon have sex with boys, I would not be able to stand up and say wholeheartedly that is not true because I do not know it. Whether or not something is happening is not determined by your knowledge. For all I know, that could indeed be the reality. However, not everybody thinks the way I do, which is a good thing. It's great to have different opinions and different thoughts. But I feel that what people need to do is to learn on a topic rather than burying your head in the sand and saying it's not happening here. Ms. Headley is bringing the American information to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Research, read, learn, talk to people. Once you are educated, then you have the knowledge. When you don't have the education, you don't have the knowledge, things will take place around you and you'll simply have no idea what is going on. You may make excuses, you may justify, you may defend, you may call it something that it is not without realizing and understanding that what you're seeing is indeed criminal activity and indeed human trafficking. So I want to be clear, whenever I present, no matter where I am, no matter the country, I present on the basis of the information I have read, I have studied, I have researched. I talk to people in the country, local law enforcement. I get to understand the culture as best as I can so that when I give my message, when I give my presentation, it is culturally relevant. For example, in Canada, it is legal to have sex with animals. Bestiality is legal. In St. Vincent and the Grenadines, at this current moment in time, to my knowledge, it is not legal to have sex with animals. But irrespective of that, I have heard from people, including police officers, that there are men and boys that have engaged in sexual activity with pig, fowl, dog, sheep, turtle, even banana tree and breadfruit. At the end of the day, when I talk to people, they educate me on what is going on. So when I bring the message, I'm able to educate on what is happening here. It is not about what goes on in Tobago or Colombia, what is going on here. And the people that I talk to, provide me with the information to better solidify the information that I give. I also want to read another question comment that was made on this article. 
How do traffickers get out? Do they swim? Now, this is really important for me to deal with because a lot of people around the world have maybe seen or heard of the movie Taken, and that is where they base their knowledge and understanding of human trafficking. Human trafficking does not have to look anything like Taken. I say does not have to because there may be some instances when human trafficking looks like Taken. But the vast majority of the time when a person is trafficked, they are not kept imprisoned in a cage. In fact, there are many instances where they have freedom, if I can use that term, but loosely, where they go out. In fact, there was an article of a young lady, I believe she was in Spain or Italy, who was trafficked, and she went shoe shopping with her pimp. And when people heard that, they questioned, how could she be trafficked? What people don't understand is there something called trauma bonding and Stockholm syndrome. That is when you will protect, defend your pimp or trafficker. That is when you will not run away or escape from them because you develop a bond, a stronghold. It is a stronghold that keeps you in that abusive relationship. Think about when a woman is in an abusive relationship and she cannot leave him. She has the freedom to walk out of the door. She spends time with friends and family. She hides the bruises. She makes excuses when you see them, but she doesn't leave. It is very difficult to leave because of fear. Fear is false evidence appearing real. Fear is irrational. It stops us from doing things. It stops us from taking chances or taking certain risks. It stops us from leaving what is a dangerous situation. Why? Because of fear. Fear is irrational. It isn't real often. We are frightened of the unknown. We are frightened of being disbelieved. So what we need to appreciate and understand, human trafficking does not require kidnapping. It does not require immigration. It does not require movement. Because when somebody said, do the traffickers swim? This is not the reality. The reality is that there are human traffickers who traffic family members. I have read articles on the internet of white Western girls being trafficked by their father. One girl makes reference to how her father would do drops. Now, when we hear the term drops, maybe we're thinking of drugs being dropped off. This was in reference to the little girl being dropped. There were times her father would take her, for example, to Disneyland. He would leave her in the restroom. And then, a few moments later, a guy would come in the restroom calling out the child's name. She would come out of the restaurant, take this guy's hand, and they'd walk off together, and she'd later be abused. Other times, she would be taken to the swimming pool. Left unattended, a guy would come up, take her away to abuse her. Other times, at a busy airport. I'm sure that we have never considered that when we see a child holding hands with a man or woman, I'm sure we have never considered when we see that in an airport that that is a drop we have seen and that indeed that child is about to be sexually abused, raped or sodomized by the person they're holding hands with. When I read that article, it was very eye-opening. I know that people are trafficked in every different way and capacity, but I had never considered that that may take place at an airport. It does make sense though, because an airport is a very busy place. And even if you were watching on the security cameras, you would not know that this is actually a drop. You may simply assume that it is a friend or a family member. Why would you think that this person, this adult has ill intent? Number one, the child is not screaming, she is not acting out. There is nothing suspicious about the behaviors that you're seeing. When you think about that scenario, that is indeed a very frightening concept because then anytime you see a child with an adult holding hands or walking together, it is highly possible that that was a drop and the child is being taken to a hotel, a motel, to a room, a confined space or location to be sexually abused or raped. When you consider that reality, that is very frightening. But my desire is not to create a spirit of fear. We know that fear doesn't come from God. He gives us power and a sound mind. My desire is for us to be better educated so that when we see something, we say something. In the subways in New York, we have posters that say, if you see something, say something. Therefore, it is for us to be able to know what we're looking at, identify it, and respond appropriately. We have to appreciate human trafficking is hidden in plain sight. 
there is a book by Nita Bells in the US, it's called In Our Own Backyard. And she talks about even sports trafficking, which is when we have recruiters that would go, for example, to Kenya or Uganda, and they would recruit these young men, and they would indeed traffic them in the sports industry. We even have orphans who are trafficked, for example, in singing choirs. When you think about that now, You'll be scratching your head and saying, wait a minute, but what about that choir that came to my church last month or last year? At the end of the day, trafficking is simply put exploitation. Anytime an individual takes advantage of another in exchange for money or something of value, and that person is under the age of consent, that is trafficking. When it's the person over the age of consent, the definition differs slightly, but it is important to note Human trafficking does not require immigration. It does not require movement. A story that I share frequently to bring it back home is of a young girl. This young girl was 14 at the time, and she gets pregnant, giving birth to a son. A few years later, she sexually abuses her son. When her son gets older, he has a, he has a girlfriend who he gets pregnant outside of marriage. They separate. The daughter reconciles with the father around 13 years later. She's really excited to be back with her father. He sexually abuses her too. Now this girl, she travels to the Caribbean where her family are originally from and spends time with her grandmother. Her grandmother is that 14 year old. Her grandmother gets her grandmother really aroused. Her grandmother then sends the granddaughter down to Mr. X's house and tells her granddaughter to have sex with Mr. X and collect money. That right there is human trafficking. Bible and stuffs it in her underwear. The Bible is removed by her aunt and uncle who sexually abuse her too. Now what I've just given you there is an example of a girl who is abused. Her father was abused. The girl, who I know personally, she's given consent to share the story, she said that she actually gave herself to her father so that he would not sexually abuse her sister. When you hear that story, what do you think of? For me, the first thing that comes to mind, generational curse. Abuse, abuse, abuse. In this story, she goes to the Caribbean, spends time with a family member. The family member sends her down the road to have sex with somebody. That is trafficking. Yes, movement was involved, but understand movement was not required. All that was required is that her grandma pimps her out, in other words, tells her to have sex with a person and collects money. If that granddaughter was in the grandmother's home and Mr. X came to the house, there would be the absence of movement. Yes, she's gone to the Caribbean, but she did not go to the Caribbean for the purpose of being prostituted out. And I want to be clear, there's no such thing as a child prostitute. Child was being prostituted, it was being done to her. When I heard this story last year, it made me incensed and outraged. I was incredibly angry. I cried about three tears, but I was so angry. And I said to her, I personally do not feel comfortable just sitting in an office or working from home, listening to domestic violence victims, listening to trafficking victims share their stories. I don't want to be reactive, I want to be proactive. And I, I said to her on the phone, I said, I want to quit my paying job and go to the Caribbean and go back to the country originally from and share my message. I said, this is a problem. What happened to you is not okay. You were trafficked. And when I told her she was trafficked, she did not accept that. However, a number of months later, after hearing me speak on the topic time and time again, the revelation finally came to her that she was indeed a victim of human trafficking. Let's bring it over to Simmons and the Grenadines. Let's bring it to the Caribbean for a moment. When we have a mother who gives her daughter to her boyfriend, her sugar daddy, her partner, that right there is human trafficking. How? Because that mother is allowing her boyfriend, sugar daddy, or partner to engage in sexual activity with her child in exchange for the utilities to be paid, groceries to be bought, or for her mobile phone data to be purchased. Right there, that is human trafficking. And when I bring it close to home, 
people actually say, well, I actually know of a person, a young girl living over there, or I know of a story of a girl whose mother would do that. This is a very big problem. In parts of the West, like the UK, the government supports us. The government provides benefits, finances, free housing. We have a fantastic support system. It is not perfect, but I can definitely say that I love that the UK provides and supports its own. In the Caribbean, for various reasons, it is not that easy to be supported for a number of reasons. However, irrespective of the support that the country provides, that does not give or entitle any person to sexually exploit their child, to allow their child to be sexually exploited for money. And when I say sexually exploit their child, I'm making reference to cyber sex trafficking. Cyber sex trafficking, once again, does not require movement. And I really want to tackle this question because around the world there are people who believe wrongly, like this individual, that trafficking requires movement. It does not require movement. In the Philippines, which is number one for cyber sex trafficking, we have girls and boys who are being sexually abused by family members in front of a webcam. Quite often a white Western man in Australia or Korea, New Zealand, the UK, the US, directs via webcam what he would like those people to do with that victim. In other words, he is directing his own live pornographic video. Right there, that is human trafficking. But pay attention, the perpetrators are not just the parents, the perpetrators are the individual watching and directing that video. Think about it. This Western man in, the, in Australia, for example, or New Zealand, in the West, he is in the comfort of his home, in the sanctity and privacy of his office, his bedroom, the lounge, and he is perpetrating a sexual offense against a child without movement being involved. When we consider websites like OnlyFans, where you can put photos and videos of various things, such as, let's say, cookery, gym, uh, gym movements, dancing, whatever you so choose, you can use OnlyFans for that purpose. Or you can use websites like OnlyFans to post up naked photographs, pornographic videos of yourself or somebody else. That there would constitute cyber sex trafficking. And the example I just gave in the Philippines creates a lot of issues when it comes to jurisdiction because the perpetrator is in another country. But what I want you to pay attention to is despite the fact the perpetrator is in another country, that does not diminish the fact that human trafficking has taken place. However, it is cyber trafficking. When you consider cyber trafficking, that should straight away defeat the argument about movement. We've even got stories of individuals like the girl in Austria that was imprisoned in her father's basement for about 24 years. There are other stories of girls in the US who were rescued and they were imprisoned for 10 years. These girls may have been kidnapped, maybe enticed, maybe coerced, and that is how they ended up falling into, ha into the hands of the predator. However, some of these victims did not go overseas to be ended up, to be caught, I should say, to be caught by this person, to end up in that person's house, basement as a sex slave. The point I'm trying to make is movement and immigration are not necessary elements of human trafficking. In the definition of trafficking, which I really refer to, because the definition will confuse the layman, it says recruiting, enticing, transporting, harboring. However, what we need to consider, the word or is between enticing or recruiting or transporting or harboring. In other words, it is not an and. When we can understand there is an or, we can appreciate trafficking is not kidnapping. They are two separate offenses. Some victims of kidnapping may become trafficked, but it is not a requisite element. Smuggling is very different from trafficking. Smuggling is when you have given consent to go to another place, another country, often for a better life. Smuggling is where you have chosen to be moved and often you have paid or offered your services for whatever reason. 
you want to leave and escape from a war-torn country, you're looking for a better opportunity, you want to support your family by earning a better income. That is smuggling. It is consenting to be moved. Human trafficking is the absence of consent, but sometimes a person is smuggled where they consented and the smuggling turns into trafficking. For example, you were smuggled from Venezuela to Trinidad. You have consented to that. But when you arrive to Trinidad, your passport and documents are taken away and you are placed above a Chinese restaurant in Arapata Avenue and forced to have sex with customers. Although it began as smuggling, it has now changed and become trafficking. But the two offenses are very different. Smuggling is very different from trafficking, but smuggling can indeed turn into trafficking. And a person who is trafficked can, of course, be smuggled out of the situation. So both of those two things are interchangeable. Another comment that was made here is beating children is not abuse. Somebody has said that because I believe that I had made reference when being interviewed for the article that corporal punishment is not appropriate and I do not agree or believe in beating children. In my opinion, beating children does not teach them respect. In fact, it teaches them fear. When you beat your child, that is not going to stop them from doing what they are doing. We may sit there and feel, well, if I beat my son or daughter, he'll be better behaved. This is not always the reality. Yes, you may beat your child until they fear you, but fear and respect are two different things. If your child is acting out, for example, behaving in a way that is inappropriate, disrespectful, or behaving promiscuously. If your child is very disrespectful, there is a reason for that. It is not about justifying or condoning that type of behavior, but understanding why is it they are having it difficult? Why is it is a challenge? Why is it it's a struggle for them to show respect to such people? Is it because of trauma? Is it because of something that may have happened to them at the hands of a man? When we have women, we have girls who have a hatred, an immense hatred, a disrespect for men. Instead of telling her, well, that's your uncle, respect him, try to understand the roots of why she's behaving that way. Sometimes it is because of being hurt or harmed, not necessarily sexually, by a person or group of people, for example, men. Maybe you have been disrespected by men. Maybe you have been abused by men. Maybe you have been mistreated by men in your workplace at home. Maybe you're a victim to domestic violence. As a result of that, your protective mechanism is to be disrespectful. When it is a child or a teenager, beating them will not help you to identify what is the reason why they're behaving this way. Similarly, if a child is promiscuous, when we have children behaving in a sexualized fashion at a young age, we often as parents and caregivers are embarrassed, ashamed, confused, and we will lash out with our mouth or with our hands, and we will try to beat that behavior out of the child without realizing that in fact, the child is displaying something that they may have experienced before or been exposed to. On the back of that, you've got to consider about the relationships that are in your life. Because I know of a person in the Caribbean, a male, who was sexually abused in their childhood by a family member, a male family member, attempted sodomy. And then when they turned older, the neighbor, I would say, who was a female, sexually abused them too. However, the sexual abuse began very gradual with grooming. And what I want to explain here is that this woman, she would actually hug the child and be intimate with the child publicly. She would even go so far as to call the child her boyfriend. This child was a minor under the age of 10. Her conduct and behavior, people turned a blind eye and thought it was innocent. It was not innocent. With predators, what often happens is they may groom the child right in front of the faces of others, and they get away with that. It is done publicly at first, and then it will move into the privacy of a bedroom and enclosed space. This child was being sexually abused by this lady systematically, and nobody had any idea. What I find concerning is that people are comfortable with her referring to this child as her boyfriend. He is a child. You've got to consider the kind of things that people say. When people make comments such as, for example, you should keep your son locked up when he gets older, your daughter is too pretty. Some of these comments are being made innocently, 
other times that person is seeing your child in a sexualized fashion which is inappropriate this young lady would teach the child the boy what sexual activities she wanted him to perform upon her he did this for a number of occasions and by his own admission he did not speak out about it because he believed that this young lady was his girlfriend he was a child he was a minor children are naive no matter what you may have thought when you were under the age of 10 it is never our place to judge because when you're in that situation how do you know how you would have reacted therefore when you uncover that your child has gone through abuse do not shout at them get angry or blame them as best as you can try to understand why they kept that thing secret this is a boy who was engaging sexually with a grown woman whether that woman went on to abuse others i do not know but i find it concerning that her behavior was being done publicly the hugging the cuddling the touching the inappropriate comments and nobody was bothered by it and that gave her the free reign to take those seemingly innocent behaviors into the privacy and confines of her bedroom i also want to read here someone has said nosy people in st vincent and the grenadines call the police now i would say that in certain cultures and communities although you may have nosy people these nosy people do not want to get involved in st vincent and the grenadines people may inform the authorities but many people will not and the reason is that they do not want to be involved they do not want to be dragged into it in fact i met a person in the caribbean who told me that a child told me of a case and because they had told me of the case whenever people tried to confide in me their secrets i shut them down because i don't want to be involved that i think is not okay if people are coming up to you they're opening up to you about something that is because there's a part of your personality that draws them in they feel comfortable enough to open up you shutting them down is not appropriate because you may be the only person to help and to rescue them. Try to consider or imagine what it's like being abused, exploited, having nude photographs and videos being taken of you. Try to consider for a moment how that would make you feel and the fact that people have suspicions but are doing nothing to protect you. At the end of the day, let's stop making it about us. Whether or not you believe the police are corrupt, that is besides the point. That is an excuse. Keep going to the police until somebody listens to you. We cannot say that every police officer is corrupt. We cannot say that every police officer is not corrupt. Irrespective of the country, there are good and bad people in every profession. But there are people who choose to serve the community that they're in, choose to serve their country, and go into the police force with those pure intentions those are the police officers you need to find but realistically speaking from my experience and from what i understand often nosy people like to be in your business like to gossip but do not want to get themselves involved so they remove themselves from the situation by not alerting the authorities and that is what we need to accept nosy people or not many do not want to get the police involved because of fear other times they would rather sit back and do nothing because of fear. They're afraid for their own personal safety and well-being, or they're concerned that nothing will be done and that things will become worse for the child. We've got to use wisdom in all things. The Bible talks about wisdom. However, we must be our brother's keeper. As it says in the subways in New York, if you see something, say something. Do not assume another nosy neighbor is doing something. You be the nosy neighbor that calls the police. Another statement or question that was made here was about proof. Somebody said, where is the proof? Now, for me, I don't even feel that it's a necessary thing to say because the absence of proof does not mean to say something does or does not exist. Right now, I am breathing oxygen. I cannot see it. I cannot smell it. That does not mean to say that oxygen does not exist just because you're not seeing or hearing about something is not proof that it doesn't exist in fact there are men and women in our lives in my life who have been victims of sexual abuse and have never confided that to myself have never confided it to yourself that doesn't mean to say it hasn't happened think about it there are people that i know there are people that you know 
that had been victims of sexual abuse and had never disclosed it, that doesn't mean to say it didn't happen. We cannot base our knowledge on what we see and what we do not see. There is a lot that goes on behind closed doors. There is a lot that takes place and we have no idea. Right here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we have the case of Anwar Jack, who was given 31 years in prison. Why? He was raped, sodomized, and drugged by a pedophile bishop and pastor from the Spiritual Baptist Church, a pillar of the community. This went on systematically for years and years and years. On one occasion, Jack Anwar is with this pedophile priest. The priest has sex with Jack twice. He then gets a condom to have sex with Jack a third time, and Jack then uses a cutlass he had hidden and chops and kills this pedophile pastor. He has 31 years in prison. Jack Anwar was being abused, was being raped and sodomized. At the time, I'm certain that there were people who had no idea. At the time, I am certain that there were people who knew of this pedophile bishop and had no idea that he was having sex with a young man called Jack Anwar. Just because they did not know that he was homosexual, that he was a rapist, does not mean to say it is not true. Unfortunately, Jack Anwar contra contracted HIV as a result of the lifestyle that was forced upon him. And from the article that I read, it sounds as though Jack Anwar may even have been trafficked in the sense of the pedophile pastor gave Jack Anwar to another man for the purpose of sex. Just because we did not know it was happening is not proof that Jack Anwar did not go through this. The evidence says otherwise. We cannot say because there's no proof it isn't happening. All it simply means is that the pimps and traffickers are very good at what they do, that they move around undetected amongst the society, amongst the communities, and nobody has no idea. It is not just about corrupt police officers. There are people in other positions of power, and I'm not referring to the government. What about immigration? What about border? What about doctors and nurses? Let's think logically. If a girl is being sexually abused, if she's being exploited sexually, she may contract STDs, she may become pregnant, she may get HIV. If she becomes pregnant, one of the quick fixes is an abortion. Therefore, human traffickers will have doctors and nurses on the payroll. It is not far-fetched, but it is completely the reality. Because many of the women in prostitution, in the sex industry, and even in trafficking, they have forced abortions. Abortions without their consent. And these doctors and nurses do not ask them the right questions for whatever reason. Despite the fact that these victims are coming into contact with people in their various professions, they go undetected. And so therefore, we need to move aside from corrupt police. We know that it's often the case, but consider the other areas, such as doctors and nurses, border control, which enables individuals to be able to do this. What about landlords? For example, a landlord who does regular inspections of the property. There may be suspicious things he sees, but he does nothing about what he sees. What about real estate agents? The list goes on and on. We need to accept whether we see something or not does not mean to say it is not happening. And with a lockdown, cyber sex trafficking will most definitely be on the increase. And that is what we need to appreciate. Cyber sex trafficking requires just internet connectivity and a webcam. Once you have a webcam and internet connectivity, you can commit the crime under cyber sex trafficking. Another question statement that was made here is, is anybody missing? This is fake news. Now, what I will say is that we know that fake news exists. It always has. People say, what about the man who landed on the moon? Is that the reality? Is that the truth? Fake news does exist 110%. But I can say to you, as a qualified U.S. attorney, six and a half to seven years licensed and practicing, the information that I transmit is not fake news. I can go one step further and say, every time I do my presentations, every time I do my Zooms, there is somebody who is in the room who comes up to me physically, WhatsApps me or communicates with me and tells me, I was a victim of sexual abuse. 
the amount of girls, the amount of boys who've been sexually abused and the people around them have no idea. I have people who tell me for the first time they were abused 20, 30, 40 years ago. They have not shared that information with anybody but myself. The fact of the matter, child abuse victims are susceptible and vulnerable to being abused again, susceptible and vulnerable to human trafficking. The fact of the matter is the only difference between abuse and trafficking when it comes to a minor is the exchange of money or something of kind. The child has been abused sexually, somebody has profited, it moves from abuse to trafficking. They are very closely interlinked. Prostitution and trafficking are also very closely interlinked. It is not fake news. Just because you do not want to hear something, just because you don't want to believe something, does not mean that it's fake news or the person transmitting the information is a troll. Knowledge is power. Let's have conversations with people in our world. Let's talk, let's learn, let's be educated. A final comment that was made or a question was about trafficking requiring force. And then also somebody had made a statement that I'd like to read. They said, are we so special that we are the only, only nation in the world not impacted? So what they have stated there is that when we are saying that there's no trafficking in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, are we the only nation in the world where this is not happening? And I appreciated that person's comment because it is completely valid. How, how can we sit down and say this nation of people where abuse exists, domestic violence exists, murder, rape, and crimes exist, does not have human trafficking? How can we make that statement? Even if that was true, when you make the statement that trafficking isn't happening here, the human traffickers know that is the next stop on our destination. That is the next place we're going to hit and attack. If it isn't happening, it definitely won't be. But the reality is that it is. And then the other person made a comment about force. That is one of the problems that people don't understand. Human trafficking does not require force. In the elements, it says force, fraud, or coercion. But the better way to explain that, force, or fraud or coercion. But when it is a minor, those three elements are not required because a person shared a story of a lady who was offered an opportunity to go overseas to be with her internet love. She had met someone over the internet. He promised her marriage. Her friends and family dissuaded her from going. She went overseas and was never seen again. Somebody commented and said, that is not forced, she went willingly. The definition of human trafficking is astute, they're smart, they're ahead of the game. Force or fraud or coercion. Human trafficking does not require force. It could be fraud, it could be coercion, or with a minor, it is none of the three. When this lady went over, she was coerced. Maybe there was fraud involved because these promises were not real. It sounds as though it could indeed be human trafficking. She was never seen again. Straight away, that is suspicious. A person goes overseas to meet someone she doesn't know, is never seen again. That is the difficulty. The layman, the laywoman, does not even know the legal definition of trafficking. They take their knowledge from movies, from social media, and that is the basis of their assumptions. An assumption is not based on evidence, a presumption is. And with a presumption, it is based on what is fact. It is based on what you have learned, read and what you have learned. This person may have been a victim of trafficking. Yes, movement was involved, but movement is not necessary. And so I wanted to address those different questions in today's viewing, so that way we can take it apart and get a bit of a different understanding and perspective. When I talk about trafficking, I use a lot of stories. I believe using stories helps us to identify and to understand that other times when a story is shared, the person thinks, well, it could only happen in that way, or there are other circumstances Ms. Headley hasn't shared. As best as I can, my desire is to let people be better educated. It is not to create fear, paranoia, or confusion. It is not to speak ill of any country or nation. Let's be realistic. If human trafficking is happening in the UK, and in the US, these are first world developed countries that are very rich, 
security cameras, CCTV, brilliant police force, safe houses, funding, donations, and charities. If it's a country that has so much wealth, that has so much available to its people, how is it happening there, but not happening here? Think about it. Trafficking happens in the UK, but what most people don't realize, the vast majority of trafficking victims in the United Kingdom are from the United Kingdom. Many are from the foster care system, the vulnerabilities, and that is the point. Every one of us has vulnerabilities. In fact, I know of a person who knows of a female. Now, this female was having it hard, meaning financially she was struggling and having it difficult. This man, from my understanding, took advantage of her needs. Like I said, we all have vulnerabilities. And when I say took advantage, what I mean is he spoke to her. He understood her situation, that she's in need for finances. And so what he did, he persuaded her to engage in sexual activity. In other words, he prostituted her for his own benefit. And after some persuasion, the girl agreed to engage in sexual activity with him. He engaged in sexual activity with her and exchanged money. He did not traffic her, but he prostituted her. And that is one of the challenges in life vulnerabilities are what make us susceptible to being taken advantage of. When we have men who are trafficked in construction, often it is the vulnerability. It may not be poverty per se, but it may be that the father is working too far from home, the commute makes it unrealistic for him to be able to live at home, so he has moved out of his home, leaving his wife and daughter alone, and he is working elsewhere. Why? For a greater salary. However, without realizing what he has done is he has left the confines of safety, moved into what sounds like a great position, but the fact that is not the case, he ends up being trafficked. He's in his same country, let's say it's China. He's in his same country, but he has been offered, if you move to this part of China, you'll get a big salary. He goes there and is exploited. He has not moved overseas. Vulnerabilities come in different ways. When you've been abused, that is your vulnerability. But vulnerabilities look different for each person. And that is what we need to understand. For a single woman, her vulnerability is different. It's not so much about being impoverished. It could be that you want to make a better life, a better salary. It may be that, for example, the profession that you are gifted in, it is not close to home, or it is in a foreign country. It is not about poverty, but you are a graphic designer. And for you to succeed in your career, you need to move to the US. Let's go. In the porn industry, why? Because of loneliness and vulnerabilities. Trafficking happens everywhere, including in the United Kingdom, the United States, and it is not always poverty. These young girls in the foster care system. We wouldn't sit there and say they're impoverished. We would say that they do not have a support system. They maybe have to be considered like this. We have an understanding of what they are going through is what has made them become vulnerable, has placed that target on their back. Somebody sees them and offers them something. That is where the forceful coercion would come in if they were an adult. When they are a minor, that is not the case. So I realize this is a lot of information to take in, but I would encourage people Instead of being so quick to jump and to judge and, and to misinterpret and to wave the fake news flag, read, research, be educated. The Bible is real. The Bible is relevant. The Bible makes sense. It can be applied in this very day and age. And it is not a joke when the Bible says people perish for lack of knowledge, because lack of knowledge is why we will have a problem existing in a nation and nothing being done about it. Let's go one step further, though. For those who don't want to accept it and want to say it's about movement, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we have girls who are being sold to foreign men. They're called yachties. These men are on the yachts. We have girls who go onto the boats and have sex with foreign men. If the girl is a minor, that is trafficking. Movement has been involved. St. Vincent and the Grenadines, it's known for tourists who come because of the Pirates of the Caribbean. Let's see it for what it is, movement, foreigner, 
immigration. We've got all of that there. We have a foreigner, which is the white man who's purchasing the girl. We have movement, the girl goes onto a boat, and then we have the victim. If we want to sit there and talk about movement, foreigners, immigration, right there is a classic case. But the reality is that is not the ex that is not the reality all the time. It is what I would say, not so much an exception, but it's not something that is happening on a day-to-day -day basis. We have high seasons and low seasons of tourism. The day-to-day -day trafficking is when that mother is allowing her daughter or son to have sex with another person in exchange for money, groceries, Wi-Fi, etc. And as I've said, right here in St. Vincent and even in Trinidad, there are people I've met who can point to a house or tell me a story where this is indeed the reality. In fact, I know a story of a guy, he was the father in this situation, and he was selling his daughter to his friends. Mother who does it, but on occasion the father. And what we have to understand with unemployment, un means that if you need need a living from home. Sorry, everyone. Uh, she just froze very quickly, but she is back. Sorry, Ms. Juanita, can you repeat what you just said? I'm wanting to send back. Are you hearing me? Yes, um, you froze for about a good 15 seconds, probably. Okay, I'm going to try to record what I just what was I talking about? I forgot on the really, It was a really important point. Working from home. That's what I was trying to explain. In St. Vincent and the Grenade people, does not happen here. And I'm sure... Correct. I would say that it's fake. When somebody said in the... And, and I indeed working for you have to repeat yourself one more time <laughs> I realize it's like the enemy doesn't want me to make this point and it's a valid and an important one and I can see here that my Wi-Fi is not even connected fully, but I'll try again. When it comes to working from home in the Caribbean, people believe that when I address that in the article on Searchlight, that that is fake news only of my teachers. That is incorrect. I'm sure people in other islands also believe working from home only apply to teachers. This is not true. In the UK, for example, I was a caseworker working with domestic violence victims. I was working from home. Caseworkers in the UK do not work from home. That is not what we do. We have interactions with clients face to face. They come into the office. We do not work from home. But with the lockdown, we had to. In other words, irrespective of your country, when there is a lockdown, employers have to become creative about how their employees can continue to work. I know people in St. Vincent and the Grenadines who work from home and they are not teachers. They are in different fields. Any job, even a bank, any job that has individuals who work using a computer or another electronic device can work from home. In the UK, bank staff are working from home. That sounds ridiculous, but it is true. It means there is a reduced service at the bank. What about phone service providers? Even though we know that we have Flow and Digicel in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, some of the staff can work from home. In other words, clients can deal with the issues by your phone. It is not always practical, it is not always realistic, but this is the reality. And like I said, anybody who works in an office building, of course a dentist couldn't really work from home, but anybody working in an office building with a computer can of course do that from home. And even, let's go one step further, social workers, counselors can work from home, 
Even doctors can work from home. I know people think I'm being ridiculous. I'm speaking from facts. In the UK, doctors have been working from home. It's quite ridiculous in my opinion that that has been the reality for months. If you are sick, you call the doctor, you send the doctor a video or you have a video call and then they'll pres prescribe you medication. So the fact of the matter is, just because something is happening here doesn't mean it can happen, it doesn't mean it will not happen, it doesn't mean it is not happening. Again, just because you do not know something doesn't mean it is not the reality. I know some nurses who are working from home. I don't know how that really even makes sense logically, but it, I know of nurses in St. Vincent working from home. I know of professionals working from home. If it was a shoe shop, for example, could you work from home? Obviously not. But the point is a lot of people, when they do their work in the office, they're using a phone, they're using a computer, they're using some kind of electronic device. Regardless of that, there are people who are unemployed, there are people who are entrepreneurs, there are people who have businesses. When the situation gets a lot worse, we have to go one step further and be creative in how we work. There are businesses that are booming in the UK. Why? Because they have found ways to allow their business to grow from where it was prior to the lockdown. The Bible says what the enemy intends for evil, God intends for good. So I would encourage us, despite our situation, to remain positive, to take the blessings and the benefits out of whatever situation we're going through. Every one of us is dealing with different things. Mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically, we're all having challenges. Not every challenge will be financial. But I would encourage us as best as we can to stay positive, to be open to new things, and to be learned. At the end of the day, the knowledge is out there. It is available for us. Knowledge is power. Be educated so you can make better choices for yourself, for the people around you, and so that way you can safeguard and protect your community, your family, even the nation you live in from exploitation. I'm really grateful for this opportunity to share today. I have to again apologize for the connectivity issues. I'm not sure what happened today. Usually when I use my internet to a hotspot, it works seamlessly. But for some reason, especially when I talked about working from home, the internet wasn't working. And so I don't know if that is the enemy trying to dissuade people from being educated on that. But at the end of the day, it is possible. We can do anything. All things are possible through Christ. We know that according to the word of God. So let us not be limited. I realize that there's so much more that can concerning the topic and that there are people here who maybe want to hear more about this or have questions. If that is the case, they can reach out to me on my Facebook, Changing Cases, that's changing, C-A-S-E-S, -E my website, changingcases.org, that's changing, C-A-S-E-S.org. -E Alternatively, they can WhatsApp me on my number, which is plus one, seven, eight, four, four, five, four, one, six, nine, three. That's plus one, seven, eight, four, four, five, four, one, six, nine, three. I have to point out the plus symbol. It is mandatory. It is not something you can put optionally. It must be there. That is my number. Please reach out to me. There is a lot of information to share on this topic. So I pray that I'll have more opportunities to share with you, hopefully on a weekly basis, Lord willing. But like I said, my Facebook, Changing Cases, my website, changingcases.org, changing, C-A-S-E-S.org. And then finally, my WhatsApp number, plus one, seven, eight, four, four, five, four, one, six, nine, three. I talk on the topic of trafficking and abuse all around the world. I'm available to speak in person or remotely. I have Zooms every Thursday from 5 p.m. St. Vincent time, which will be around 6 p.m., I believe, in Canada. Please reach out to me if you'd like to be a part of the Zooms. I have podcasts. One is inspirational, one is educational. I decided that despite the lockdown, I'm going to take this time working from home and do something productive. And so from the time of the lockdown, I've started two Zooms. I've done podcasts. I'm doing a lot of things. I believe in using whatever I have, the skills, tools, and resources to do something positive, and I'd encourage you to do the same. So I'm so grateful to have had this platform, and I trust the information today has been useful. God bless you all. Thank you so much, Ms. Headley, for coming in today. Thank you so much for giving us the education that we needed. Um, I'm going to put your number here. Um, so there you have it, folks.
Thank you so much again for coming in. We are so happy to have you. Um, is there any last remarks you would like to say before you head off? I would just like to encourage people to reach out to me. This is Human Trafficking Month, the month of January. But this is a message that is not limited to just one month, but it is a message that needs to be shared all around the world. My desire is to educate, empower, and inspire. It is never to create fear or paranoia, but as a bad comes to me. This is my passion. I wish this could be my dream, my dream job. I think she cut out folks, but that's okay. That's all right. Uh, I don't know if I'm back. I don't know why this is happening. I'm trying to make a plug, and then I must say this before I go. I was trying to say that the work that I do, I love it. It is my dream job. I dream about doing this full time, but it's completely pro bono, and therefore I have to usually go back home, work, make some money, and then travel again. But I say that because if there are people who like to support my ministry, they can do that by reaching out to me. They can donate through Western Union, PayPal, any which way. Please, please, I do need the support so that I can continue to do this. It's an important message. I love what I do. I've been pro bono for almost 10 years, which means unpaid for about a decade now doing this kind of work. But I need support. So if people would like to support, they can do so through any means. But it is not about the money. It is all about the message. And so my primary focus is on spreading this message worldwide. So I'm open for invitations. I speak seven days a week all around the world. I've traveled to 38 countries thus far. And even in the lockdown, I'm abroad. So I praise the Lord for opening that door. But again, people can just contact me, reach out to me, share with me whatever they're struggling with, their stories, whatever it may be. I'm available to listen and to support and to point them in the right direction. I know some counselors. I know people in law enforcement in a number of countries overseas. However, I can help. I believe in being the change you want to see. And so therefore, the little I can do as one person, I am willing to do that. So people can contact me. I am available. As the Bible says, there's the story of the guy. He didn't say, Lord, send her. He said, Lord, send me. I am here, willing to be used by God. And for those who pray, I always need prayers. So please do keep me in your prayers. And like I said, I hope there'll be more opportunity for me to share on a regular basis. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So Thank you again, folks. Thank you again, everyone who tuned in. Thank you to everybody who shared. Thank you to everybody who liked. And again, thank you, Miss Juanita, for coming in today. So God bless everyone, and have a good afternoon. Thank you.
Promises still stand. We are still oh. Oh. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, we are still. at home with you. This is our confidence. God, you never fail me. And he never will. And I never 